Tell them your name. Brian Douglas. <laughs> Are you the real Batman? No. No? No. No. <laughs> then why do you dress up like him? <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh shush, 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 shush. So you think Batman's made Gotham a better place? Hmm? Yeah. Look at me. Look at me! Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and today we're going to explore my theories for the origins of Heath Ledger's Joker, as featured in Christopher Nolan's Batman trilogy, by going through how the villains appeared in the comics and how they'd been adapted for the films. I think it goes without saying that the most explosive special effect used in The Dark Knight was Heath Ledger's outstanding performance as a Joker. Going through my videos on Batman Begins, I noticed there were a few comments asking me to cover The Dark Knight, and more specifically, some possible theories as to the origins of Heath Ledger's mysterious Joker, and after watching the movie for the 50th time, I think I may have figured it out. While DC Comics does feature elements of the supernatural, along with its list of villains and heroes with superhuman abilities, the Nolanverse adaptation was much more grounded in reality. As I mentioned earlier, I go into the creative process and what Nolan attempted to achieve with Batman Begins in another video, which I'll leave links to below. But suffice to say that his aim was to make the comics more accessible to modern audiences. Each of the villains in his films, beginning with Ra's al Ghul in Batman Begins, the Joker in The Dark Knight, and Bane in The Dark Knight Rises, were all as epic as their comic book counterparts, but all had elements of their history changed to make the films more grounded. In the comics, Ra's al Ghul was over 600 years old, having extended his life for centuries after discovering and using the Lazarus Pits, which were pools comprised of chemicals that had restorative properties which healed anyone that bathed in them. While in the film series, the character was a mercenary no older than 60 that trained with the ancient group known as the League of Shadows before taking on the role of their leader. Though he did die in Batman Begins, he reappears to Bruce as a spectre while he's in captivity in The Dark Knight Rises. It's important to note that his reappearance is not due to any mystical or magical properties, and is not actually physical, but symbolic, hearkening back to the lesson he taught Bruce. If you devote yourself to an ideal, and if they can't stop you, then you become something else entirely. Which is... Legend, Mr. Wayne. In this instance, it's the legacy of Ra's al Ghul which had come back to haunt Bruce, personified by the trilogy's third antagonist, Bane, who, alongside Talia, the daughter of Ra's al Ghul himself, sought revenge for his death and the destruction of the League of Shadows. Bane, on the other hand, was a world-class fighter in the comics and tactical genius who enhanced his great natural strength with a steroid called Venom, making him one of Batman's deadliest opponents, even breaking his back in the Nightfall trilogy, elements of which were adopted for the final film of the series. However, his addiction to Venom was removed for the film, which saw him wear a mask to hold back the pain he had felt from the extensive damage done to his face many years prior. At the same time, the removal of his mask caused him to feel such pain that he temporarily possessed seemingly superhuman strength, though this was likely an influx of adrenaline. Thus, Nolan had essentially made changes to both Ra's al Ghul and Bane to help ground them in reality. It's no surprise then that the same would be done for the Joker, aka the Clown Prince of Crime. What is it with you? What made you what you are? Girlfriend killed by the mob, maybe? Brother carved up by some mugger? Something like that, I know! something like that happened to me. In the comics, the Joker is the archenemy and symbolic antithesis of Batman, first introduced in the 1940 debut issue of Batman, where he announced that he would kill three of Gotham's most prominent citizens, including the mayor. Another plot point I'm sure you remember being used in The Dark Knight. That Joker card pinned to the body. Forensics found three sets of DNA. Any matches? All three. The DNA belongs to Judge Cirillo, Harvey Dent, and Commissioner Lowe. The Joker's telling us who he's targeting. Initially portrayed as a violent sociopath who murdered people for his own amusement, the Joker was then transformed into a goofy trickster during the 1950s and 60s due to the Comics Code Authority, before finally returning to his darker roots as a vicious, unpredictable, psychopathic killer in the 1970s. Over the course of his publication history, the Joker has been synonymous with the Red Hood Gang, either as its leader or as a person who had been tricked into wearing the hood. Detective Comics issue number 168 introduced the Joker's first origin story as the Red Hood, a criminal who, during his final heist, leaped into a vat of chemicals to escape Batman. His resulting disfigurement led him to adopt the name, the Joker, from the playing cards he came to resemble, and from that point onwards, he began developing a sadistic sense of humour. Alan Moore's 1988 seminal masterpiece, Batman The Killing Joke, built on the Joker's 1950s origin, portraying him as a failed comedian pressured into committing crime as the Red Hood to support his pregnant wife. 
During the story, Batman's interference causes him to leap into a chemical vat, which disfigured him, and this, combined with the trauma of his pregnant wife's accidental death, caused him to go insane and become the Joker. This is one outstanding graphic novel that is depressing, unsettling, and all the time illuminating, as the entire premise of the story is the Joker attempting to make Commissioner Gordon go insane by doing unspeakable things to his daughter and the Commissioner himself, under the belief that all it took was one bad day to drive a normal man insane. This, I think, is the direction the new Joker movie will go. Not with the whole bit including the Commissioner, as I don't think this will feature Batman, but with the idea that the Joker was a failed comedian who had lost everything over the course of one fateful day. Given all of this, and considering Nolan had reimagined the world of Batman, I don't believe this was the origin adopted for Heath Ledger's Joker in The Dark Knight. Though Heath Ledger's Joker is seen donning the clown makeup, I also don't think this is a reference to a past life as a clown or entertainer, but instead a symbolic gesture like putting on war paint or a bat costume. His unique scars would have also made him very recognisable, making the use of clown makeup with an exaggerated smile more of a strategic move. If we explore some of the Joker's seemingly batshit antics in the film and peer into his mental state, it seems as though it's more likely that he's an experienced military veteran with a traumatic past, likely special ops that was missing in action. The reason I say this is that there is no record of this that can be obtained by either the police or Batman, who is the most technologically advanced detective on Earth, indicating that his identity was either restricted or deleted by the government. What do we got? Nothing. No matches on prints, DNA, dental, clothing is custom, no labels, nothing in his pockets but names and lint. The level of planning and precision that went into the execution of the daring bank robbery in the film's introduction, his escape from the police station, coupled with his ability to endure intense interrogations, all lead me to believe that he was a damaged yet skilled former member of the Green Berets that had been injured in an overseas conflict and declared MIA before making his way back home to Gotham. Now, the Green Berets are in essence a special operations force tasked with five primary mission parameters. Unconventional warfare, foreign internal defense, special reconnaissance, direct action, and counter-terrorism. And the Joker utilizes all of these elements during his one-man war to make the city of Gotham burn. The fact that nobody at home seemed to care about the sacrifice he had made for them, along with those made by his comrades, is even mentioned in his line, a truckload of soldiers getting blown up being part of the plan, which I also believe is a possible direct reference to what had happened to him and his unit. After being physically and psychologically scarred during the war, he came back home to Gotham, where his mission then became to destabilize the so-called plan, and introduced anarchy using the skills he'd been taught. I took your little plan and I turned it on itself. Look what I did this city with a few drums of gas and a couple of bullets. Hmm? Introduce a little anarchy. Upset the established order and everything becomes chaos. In the film, Ledger's Joker was able to tactfully adjust his personality and methods depending on who he was talking to, and he knew exactly the reaction he'd get, a trait common among interrogators, and a skill he would have likely refined in the military. To Gamble and his henchmen, he's an abused child who suffered abuse, appealing to the fact that they were likely products of abuse and neglect themselves. To Rachel, he's a man mourning a tragic love, something that she was also dealing with. He also pokes fun at Gordon's isolation, and even manages to appeal to Dent's hunger for fairness. Oh, and you know the thing about chaos. It's fair. Each of his missions, except the final one which was ultimately stopped by Batman, were executed perfectly from the bank robbery, targeted assassinations, to the public requests for Batman to reveal his identity, essentially making Gotham hold Batman responsible for the Joker's crimes. Even his capture and subsequent escape were all part of the plan, and indication that the Joker must have had considerable training tantamount to that which Bruce himself would have received under the League of Shadows. What's probably the most telling moment is his supposed interrogation, which ends up being a cross-examination of Batman himself. By this stage in the film, Batman had fought and beaten the likes of Ra's al Ghul, Scarecrow, and numerous other villains, but in this very moment, he had no power over the Joker. During the scene, Batman uses all of his scare tactics on him, but it's actually the Joker who is toying with him, testing how far he could push the Batman. In fact, it almost feels like the Joker is the instructor, and Batman is his student. Ah, oh. oh. never start with the head. The victim gets all fuzzy. He can't feel the neck. See? He's also shown to be well versed in the customs and operations of the city, the police, and the National Guard, which helped him cultivate an effective plan. 
Another revealing moment is during the police parade, where he blends in with the officers. At first I was like, how did they not notice him there, until I realised that without his makeup, he just looked like a man who had been injured in the line of duty. Which he essentially had been. Though he was unstable, I also don't think he was as crazy as his comic book counterpart, as nothing he did in the film was random. And though he lied to Harvey Dent by saying that he didn't have a plan, his actions were much more revealing. He is aware that he's a monster, so to speak, and his goal was to bring an entire city to its knees and prove that deep down, everyone was as ugly on the inside as he was. What appeared as crazy was purely a character that reveled in the chaos he created. It's for these reasons that I believe that Heath Ledger's Joker was indeed a war veteran with PTSD that had permanently adopted the persona of the Joker. In contrast to Batman, who was also driven by trauma, but still went back to being Bruce Wayne, while the Joker's true identity was now lost. The Joker is in essence the antithesis of Batman, and his equal. Batman can't kill him because he's not like him, and the Joker won't kill Batman because he strives to have Batman break his number one rule. Batman is as incorruptible as the Joker is irredeemable. Well that's all for today folks, I hope you've enjoyed this video. This is just my personal theory and I'd love to hear some of your theories and ideas on the Joker's origins and whether you agree so please share those in the comments below. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content and if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. What you do with all your mum? You see, I'm a guy of simple taste. I enjoy uh, dynamite, gunpowder, and gasoline. And you know the thing that they have in common? They're cheap. It's not about money. It's about sending a message. Everything burns.